Do you know the name Tyler Brule? Do you know wallpaper or monocle? This is a whole new world of media that we're about to discuss and discover if you don't already know it today. Uh, Tyler started out life in Manitoba, so he qualifies almost as a near Saskatchewanian. And we've reached him in Zurich in Switzerland to talk about what, how this media empire that you're creating. Welcome. Thanks so much for being with us. Thanks, Pamela. Very good to talk to you. Now, you are hosting, I, 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 you run this magazine, you run a 24-hour radio channel, you do podcasts, you're creating this, uh, this new media world. But one of the things you've just returned from, I think it was late in September, you did something called a meeting of chiefs or a chiefs meeting in Semaritz. This was, as I could hear it, uh, a bit like Davos for the arts and culture scene, although you had people there talking about risk, business leaders, and even the Red Cross. Tell me what your current thinking is about where we are in this cycle. Well, I'm speaking to you from a very curious country. Switzerland, of course, is a very familiar brand to most people around the world. But it's also a country which has really shown, I think, quite an exemplary level of, of leadership right now. Uh, and it's, in some ways, it starts to to irk people too, because as, as you said, <laughs> we run a variety of different different outlets. Uh, and, and when we report from here versus if we're reporting from Tokyo or New York or Los Angeles or, or other places where we have correspondents, uh, people in the US, the UK, Australia, sometimes the things we say about Switzerland from Switzerland starts to rankle people because the government is very pro business. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the case level here has not been that high. Some, you know, it, you could say many ways. It's it's similar to 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 Canada. It's it's but right. it's slightly new. It's slightly nuanced. I think what is what is happening here, and and that is because Switzerland has always been a crossroads. It is a country which, of course, is home to many multinationals, and Switzerland knows that it needs to to push forward. And just recently, just before we did the conference, we had the president of the federal council. Switzerland currently has a, a woman president, Simonetta Samaruga, and she said, we need to learn how to live with this. And I think it's a very, very different right. narrative than we've heard from many other places. It's not a leader saying, let's wait for the vaccine and see what happens. We need to move forward as a society. And that was a little bit what we were trying to do in, in Sagmore. It's just the mere fact that we were having a conference with real warm bodies in the room, 100 people gathered, was, was a bit of a statement uh, as well. We wanted to bring people together, of course, in a safe environment or an environment that respected the guidelines of Switzerland, but also demonstrating that people do want to gather. They want to have a discussion. They want to look each other in the eye uh, and also, yeah. of course, come from diverse backgrounds from many corners of the world. And and get on planes to do it, presumably, or or trains, I suppose, in Europe, you can still do that. I guess what what's really, and we're all grappling with this, I mean, Canada is seeing its numbers go back up because we have opened with schools and whatnot. And, and what's puzzled me from the beginning is why weren't we up to this task? Where were our leaders in our thought process? This is not impossible for sophisticated modern countries to deal with. I, I think you're absolutely right. And we can, goodness, we could uh, you know, do several programs about <laughs> this glaring lack of leadership in so many corners of, of the world. I've spent the better part of 30 years living in, in London. I now live in, in Zurich. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm dismayed when I look back across the, the English Channel at what's happening in the UK right now, just messaging which changes every single week. It almost changes you know, from press conference to press conference. Work right. from home, go back to the office, work from home again. And again, and here we're talking about one of, of course, a capital of one of, one, of a G7 economy, and, and they simply can't, can't get it together. And, and yet um, you can fly 90 minutes or, or even 45 minutes, and you can see countries which have a much firmer grasp on things. So this is, from your perspective, a leadership issue. When you hear all these people talking, even I'm, I would have been fascinated to hear the uh, the people from the Red Cross, like managing risk, again, not an issue. You and I have been in war zones. We know how to manage risk on a simple basis, and there, it's not impossible to um, 
work that out in a in a larger scene. What what was missing? Was it just that fear took hold? What what stopped us from answering this problem? I think that many areas of the public sector and also the private sector uh, have, of course, become very risk averse. I think probably over Mm -hmm. the last two decades, whether it comes to policies, whether it's going and standing up and and making a public statement as a politician or a CEO, every single crease is is ironed out of, of a speech or a statement. So we're somehow able to guarantee there's going to be no blowback <laughs> for the press. There's going to be no uh, lawsuits coming down the track. And of course, yes, you know, these things need to happen. But somehow right. in all of this, what, when we're talking about risk, especially in the midst of, of COVID, we're also talking about humanity here. And, and humanity does come with wrinkles. And and to live as a society, it does come with with risk. And 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 right now, I think somehow we've we've lost sight of the fact that in many developed countries, most developed countries, you could say that very early on, March, April, the right measures were taken in terms of making sure hospital beds were cleared and and there was enough material required. Certainly, some countries did fall down uh, in those areas as well. But somehow we managed to get on top of things. And now, of course, we see infection rates are climbing up. If I look at around the neighborhood here, mm. Switzerland, across the border to Germany, uh, south to Italy, it's largely young people uh, who, of course, are being infected. They're not burdening the healthcare system. And, and of course, many of them are also a- asymptomatic. But somehow, and this goes back to us, of course, being media people, Pamela, there's something about that ticker. There is something about that obsession, about that daily number. Very easy to have, <laughs> of course, you know, a, a big flashing red number on screen. And 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 this also, and this is where I think the media has right. something to answer for here, also creates a level of panic with very little explanation in the backgrounds. And, and one thing we've seen here, in fact, is that one of the, the heads of the, the Federal Office of Public Health in Switzerland said, we should just start reporting on numbers weekly because it doesn't help people's mental health to be banged over the head every day at one o'clock with this with this number uh, w- w- when there's very little analysis behind it. Well, and the other real problem, and we're seeing this, is that as as the cliche goes, you know, never miss an opportunity if you're a political leader or a politician um, in the midst of a crisis, because we are seeing governments um, using this, if you will, to restrict rights and freedoms, to carry on um, passing legislation without scrutiny of of the opposition or other houses like the Senate in our country. We're seeing in some of our provinces in Canada, people being hauled off to jail if they're breaking quarantine under special emergency powers. Now, I don't think people should be breaking quarantine, obviously, but but we have to be careful how far we go with this. Absolutely. My my mom was here all, all summer and that's that is uh, she lives in Toronto and she was over on on this side of the Atlantic and mm-hmm. went home to 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 Toronto and of course the, the police came and, and paid a visit now okay fine they should uh, that that's part of what they do but I also think it's it's also extraordinarily heavy-handed because I think we also have to get back to a place about self-responsibility and I think this is somehow or it's maybe a junction in the road where I think a lot of the Anglo world, sometimes I wonder if it's a Commonwealth thing, because I think the Brits, the Canadians, the Aussies, they all behave in a slightly similar way. There's a certain nanny state mentality that goes with things. And that means nanny is going to tell you what to mm-hmm. do and how to behave. In the Germanic world where I'm standing, there is, I think, a much greater focus and emphasis on your self-responsibility as, as a citizen. So we as the government are not going to tell you to wear a helmet on a bicycle. If you want to wear a helmet on a bicycle, go ahead. Uh, you know that that's you know, probably going to limit head injuries. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, if you want to have the wind in your hair, you can do that too. And and I think that that goes through so many elements of, of society. I think people are often amazed that, yes, you can walk down the street you know, with a, with a can of beer open or a glass of wine if you want. And guess what? Society is not going to unravel as a result. And and I think this is incredibly important. But I, on the other side, though, I think maybe we're just too far down the track in Canada maybe in other Anglo societies as well, we're just, we're so conditioned to waiting for Mm -hmm. the politician. We're waiting for law enforcement to tell us what to do, as opposed to actually using that good old thing called common sense. What do people think from where you are, from your vantage point on the Swedish approach 
They just said, look, we're, we're going to leave stuff open. Be careful, wear a mask, be conscious, but we can't afford to shut down our economy. Isn't it fascinating to look at the evolution of a Swedish story going back to April when people started to pay attention a little bit mm-hmm. in Sweden? Uh, you know, they're, they're not following the rules. They're going their own direction. Why aren't they paying attention? As, as, as if here again, you have, of course, one of the most developed societies, you could say, in many ways, uh, when it comes to, of course, governance, when it comes to a, a rather small country that has created some very powerful global brands. It, people were sort of questioning Sweden in a way that that they hadn't even thought this through. But of course, they had and it, and it was considered. And for sure, the spotlight is swinging back to Sweden now in a more positive way. What did they get right? What did they what did they know? Or was it just Again, common sense that on one side, society does need to become infected, or at least a certain element of society does. They've, there's been a quasi following of this of this yeah, herd uh, you know, in, infection policy, and now it's Sweden really stands in stark contrast mm-hmm. to to Denmark, uh, which is going through a new series of lockdown procedures. Finland and Norway largely closed. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, you could go to Finland and you could say Finland has a very uh, has had a very low death rate, but also. Fin- and at the same time, has been has been pretty heavy-handed uh, in terms of of, of course uh, being closed down. There's also I was talking to a doctor though today, a Finnish doctor in Switzerland, who said, "Well, you know," and he said, "You probably understand this as a Canadian." He goes, "All of Finland, all five million Finns, all have a house on the lake, um, no matter where they sit socioeconomically." So he said, "We're all two <laughs> kilometers apart." So he said, "He said seriously." He goes, "As a doctor, he said that's actually why we've come out of an August, early September, all the Finns have been away, uh, and that's why the country has low infection rates." No, it's absolutely true. I spent since March. I've been largely at Fishing Lake in Saskatchewan. You, we're, we're socially distanced just by virtue of geography, <laughs> so exactly. it does really work, and our numbers are low. You talked about, uh, and and we'll come back to the the political context a bit later. But you talked about the responsibility of journalists, and honestly, it's it's it seems like it's kind of finally one of those stories they can understand, you know, uh, big bad virus and, and rules and government intervention. And I'm, I am worried about the state and the fate and the future of journalism. You still consider yourself a journalist, do you? Yes. When I have to fill out one of those forms going into a country, I, even though I, (laughs) even though I own a business and do many things, absolutely. I, 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 um, I yeah I I've I always wanted to, well not always wanted to be a journalist but you know, you have a of course you you have a maybe something to answer for in that as well uh, thinking back to uh, your time uh, during the Falklands conflict I could remember living in Montreal Pamela watching you on CTV and <laughs> and and I saw I saw you were a, a young boy in, then <laughs> yeah. Well, but I, I, you know, I saw an example of, of 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 you know Canadians venturing out in the world to tell to tell global stories, um, and and certainly there was you know you and some of your colleagues, uh, you know, at that time when yeah we're talking. You wanted about, to be Peter Jennings when you grew up. Is I that did. true? I did. I wanted to be Peter Jennings because I spent time in, in Ottawa. I used to like watching you on on uh, on Canada AM. I think I might even <laughs> stalked you for an autograph once upon a time. But you know, listen, it's but for sure that you know, and and I think as a yeah as as a Canadian who probably did grow up in that sort of golden age of, of journalism as well, uh, and, and certainly broadcast journalism. If we think back to the late 70s and the early, I guess the early 80s or mid 80s as well, uh, it, w- it was quite a rem- remarkable time. And and so, yes, uh, that's I, I wanted to be a broadcast journalist. Uh, I may be diverted. I'm probably, I've got more ink on my fingers of, uh, these days, but uh, I get around a microphone uh, from, from time to time. But yes, uh, fully, uh, fully a paid up journalist still. And it wasn't always, a, you, you did a tour in Afghanistan in, uh, I guess, in the mid-90s, and, and, and you had very serious injuries. You were shot at. You were not, I mean, obviously, you've, re, you've recovered from that, but that was, that was serious. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, I, I think back to, I recall that uh, you were, uh, I, I literally can remember you being in, I believe it was in Buenos Aires, uh, reporting as well. Mm-hmm. And I think there was some, uh, certainly some shrapnel or, or gunshot uh, as well. We got well. shot and, at, that's yes. for sure. And 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 it's funny how how you sort of you, you get drawn, uh, of course, to the story. And and I you know I left Canada and and went to London and um, and and was was certainly uh, I was also fortunate. I was able to get some amazing assignments. And one of them was yes was was going to Afghanistan um, in the mid '90s when Afghanistan was was largely a, a 
forgotten conflict. Uh, people, uh, it was you know the Russians had left. It was it was pre Taliban, and and yet it was a. A, a, a zone of conflict which was incredibly dangerous. Um, the only people that were there were the were the Red Cross and Médecins Sans Frontières, and you know, mm-hmm. wrong place, wrong time. Uh, I wouldn't even say the enthusiasm of of being a young journalist, but just a little a little bit misguided by our team and and also the wrong vehicle as well. And we were uh, we uh, we were shot. And and funnily funnily enough, there's a Saskatchewan angle to all of this because. Do tell. Uh, I was shot twice. I was shot in both arms, uh, and, and was was very was very fortunate uh, to, uh, of course, to uh, to yeah be be rescued by the uh, Swiss delegation from the Red Cross, and and then my interpreter Sabur, who was beside me, um, he was shot through the back of the head uh, and and lived in oh. brain damage, and uh, and he ended up um, in Regina, uh, and he was uh, not not for treatment, but um, but. Over time, right. uh, and with the help of the Red Cross, was they they got him to Canada, and um, and he made his way to Saskatchewan. Unbelievable! Yeah, I can imagine from 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 Kabul Kabul to Regina. <laughs> yes, no kidding. Um, going the other way was probably a little more um, doable. You talked about that incident, and and what struck me about one of the stories is that you had a gut instinct. Something told you that you were in the wrong place at the wrong time and in, in the wrong vehicle. And that that kind of gut instinct you have listened to later on. There was another story um, post nine 11, where you were boarding a plane and you got off it yes. and caused quite a scene. I think you were think banned so. for, on flights for a while. <laughs> um, indeed. Uh, <laughs> Tell me a little bit about living with that gut instinct. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because we, uh, of course, and this goes back to what, where we started a little bit about risk, isn't it? That uh, you know, that sometimes we do see mm-hmm. a fork in the road for our, our careers or relationships or family, and and this was one of those moments where I was reminded, or and, and certainly this is also a case where, yeah, vision is occasionally, uh, it, sort of hindsight is certainly when it comes to vision twenty twenty. And we we had we had a moment when we were sitting in the vehicle and just I hadn't been in many zones of conflict, but I'd been in enough, and I thought it's just incredibly quiet where we were in Kabul, and and yet I I I'd only mm-hmm. been in Afghanistan for about three days, so um, how could I be the ex- expert on it but you know nevertheless we, we behave in, in in a certain way and of course we can read signals and signs and it was just it was just it was just too eerily still and i i said to uh to our our, our both our driver and and sabur our interpreter i said i said do you feel safe going down this stretch of the road and they said you know, absolutely and i said again i said Let's put, of course, the you know the payments <laughs> that you're getting for all of this. Uh, let's put, you know, let's put. You know, would you would you drive your wife and kids um, down this road? And, and, and the yeah. answer came absolutely, we would. And and still there was that that sort of knot that's somewhere around your diaphragm. And I just this just feels a bit strange. And I was with a traveling with a British photographer, Zed Nelson. And as we rolled uh, rolled down the road, it, you know, it couldn't have been thirty seconds later, and we we were uh, what we thought was was uh, was crossfire, but then very soon, uh, very many, you know, not many seconds later, realized that um, that we were the target, and uh, but we were able to, yeah, we were able to get spin the vehicle around, but unfortunately, you know, all the windows blew in, and um, and you can of course try to hide right. behind or hide below the window line, but um, this particular Nissan was not bulletproof, and it was you know that was also a time before yes, every, no every correspondent had to wear a helmet, and everyone was wearing bulletproof vests and things like that as well. It wasn't it wasn't standard kit uh, e- even then, and also you know, listen, I mean Afghanistan, right. this is something that, that shouldn't have happened, and afterwards there was a there was quite a big. Um, Red Cross investigation as to why this, you know, what, we were in a UN vehicle. Why was our UN vehicle targeted, etc.? But of course, it was an, it was an anti-interventionist uh, Mujahideen faction, and yeah, and that's you know, and but again, mm-hmm. listen, the story has it ha- has a happy ending. Yes, here you are. But is I, I felt I was in Kabul several times when our troops were there after we went in post nine eleven, and it was a very unsafe place. And you do have you 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 have to listen to your gut in those moments because your life is on the line. So it's a good thing you have a strong gut instinct. Yeah, and absolutely. And and just to to your the other part of your question, it was it was a similar instance you know after 9 11 you know, of course the canadian airports were some of the first to reopen in in north america i, I was in new york on 9 11 i um and with a h- series of colleagues uh, there were about 
20 of us in New York, uh, you know, we drove up to Toronto uh, and uh, and thought that actually probably the Canadian airports would, would reopen first, which was, was the case, and was flying out of Toronto on one of the first flights to Frankfurt. And and that was just one of those situations as well where it was such, if you remember, it was just, you know, again, legislation had come in, all of, all of these new it security was, measures, which no exactly. one knew how to, to implement yep. them. And I, I remember getting on the plane thinking, this is absolutely ridiculous watching what was going on and then being on the aircraft and literally you know going about pulling out my newspapers or whatever pre-flight and I found actually a, a rather large Swiss army knife which of course I forgot was in my luggage and I said to the crew I said uh look I said I found this in my my bag I said I totally forgot about this like oh they said right and um and I said you know so they I, I said you know here you go I gave it to them and uh and then you know that caused a delay in the takeoff, and uh, and then there was a point as well where I just I was just sitting there going I don't know you know if if this happened to me you know and then I was just sort of watching um, other passengers get on board I thought I don't need to fly today and then I I said to the crew I said I I'm I'm going to get off the aircraft right. I mean they were still boarding the flight I wasn't delaying anybody and uh, and the crew tried to convince me they said look you know um it, you know, this is an awful situation what happened in new york and i said no i said i get all of that i said you know i just i don't need to get to frankfurt today i said i have no check bags i said i've just got what i have here um i'm going to get off the aircraft and um they said yeah your choice and sure enough uh i um i walked to the top of the, gate, the ramp and the rcmp was waiting for me um and there was a lot of questioning and and whatnot and uh, but yeah then i i i Went back to my mom's place in Toronto, went to fly on the following Monday and got on the plane again. And then the RCMP came on board and said, you know, can you come with us? And um, and yeah. And then they said, look, you need you need to apologize wow. to Air Canada for delaying an aircraft. And I said, uh, I'm not apologizing for anything. I said, I didn't do anything wrong. I said it was extraordinary <laughs> times. And I said, you know, they said, oh, well, just you just have to write a letter to Mr. Milton and, and apologize. And anyway, I think I was on I was on the no fly list for 10 years. <laughs> Anyway, but you went on to now. do you went on to do work for Air Canada with one of your other businesses, which was um, exactly yeah, yeah. which which <laughs> is which is promotion. true. I don't know, maybe it was some it was some it was some type of compensation. I, I don't know. But anyway, it was as it and these are also you know ex- extraordinary. You know, it wasn't yeah, extraordinary, extraordinary time, times. Absolutely, like, like the moment we live in now. Yes, it is. That's exactly right. And we really have no idea where we're headed. I want this this world of journalism that you're in because you talk and we're having this conversation, uh, sharing experiences. And then I read things about you in the magazine, uh, Monocle. I, I don't know whether this is a little bit of tall poppy syndrome that you've been so successful that that people um, envy or, or are jealous of that. But but you're described as a jet setting style maven and living the life from the vantage point of seat 1A and business class. Uh, can you be both? Absolutely. I think uh, <laughs> I, I meet people all the time who can be a journalist and can be uh, you know, born whether they're in the, from the prairies or they're from uh, the wilds of Australia or the hinterland of Sweden. And, 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 and of course uh, you, you can, you can be both. And I, and I have no problem you know, with the fact that uh, it's my own company. I, if I choose to fly around the world. However, uh, I like uh, where I'm not uh, Providing a series of government services, uh, and and I'm you know, more to the point. I'm just I'm I'm very proud of the fact that I you know, I wasn't born into a regal household uh, in in Winnipeg uh, you know, from you know, two sets of yeah I think quite um, families of modest means in Canada modest, and yeah. we are very happy that that I've yeah that I've managed to to do what I've done over you know I guess it. 12, 25, 30 year career now in, in journalism uh, and uh, and don't feel defensive about it, uh, but more feel you know quite proud. And also that we're running an organization now where I hope that you know, we're attracting, well, not hope, I know we are, we're attracting also a new generation of journalists who recognize the fact that just posting links all day and, and making <laughs> comments on screen is not journalism, but, but we're able to put people on planes even today uh, and and allow people to be witness to what's happening around the world and and I I'm very proud of that. So so Monocle is particularly a magazine for I don't know the 1% or the 2%. Your 
this is definitely a business model. You're just doing this. How do you reconcile that or do you even feel the need when we see such a uh, dramatic disparity in our country? Are you just saying this is my, not in our country, in our world, um, this is my niche. It's a niche I can make um, a living. I can build a company on this. Like, are, are there any tensions there inside your head? No tensions whatsoever because – if I think, if I look at the current issue, which you probably hasn't hasn't landed in Canada, but you know, you, you'd find it online. I think, you know, we were there with our correspondent uh, in Beirut, and and we're running a wonderful diary of of what has happened off uh, off the back of of that horrendous blast uh, in yep. in the harbor. I I just wrote an obituary for Lady Yvonne Cochrane, <laughs> someone who I've been I'd been visiting in Beirut for the last twenty years. She died at ninety eight. Uh, after uh, the, the windows were, were blown in in her palace in Beirut, uh, and and some people, of course, can look at that and say, "Oh, well, you know, that is uh, you know, that that is you know, one one part of journalism." But I stand by the fact that you know, at the front of the magazine, you know, we cover global affairs in all its forms. Uh, you know, we're about to send people to Aleppo right now to go and do a story. So, yeah, you know, shouldn't we be allowed to do that? And and also, shouldn't we be allowed to do that? You know, at a time when we see some public service broadcasters um, really behaving like like private enterprises. Uh, so I have to I have to compete against the BBC, which um, I'm also right. helping pay for on one side. So uh, <laughs> no, there's nothing to rec- nothing to reconcile in my head uh, at all. We are we are out there we are out there covering the world, and uh, and by the way, at the end of the day, uh, if of course we're we are a business, and and why should we be ashamed of, of running a company? Whether it's you know, and I would say, do we do we target an affluent audience? Up to a point, but you know, I would say there's also, I mean, this is there's. I just recall actually a wonderful note I, I received from a gentleman who is working in a in a fish packing plant in the north of England and just said, you know, and he's really not part of the one percent at all. He's not part of the two. Right. He's right. you know, you would say that socioeconomically, he is probably not our our target, but yet he is because he said, What does Monocle do? He said, It takes me somewhere that the Times or the BBC and many others, they don't, they don't take me to these places. And, and I think, wow, then I, when you read things like that, then you feel that you are delivering a level of public service and, and, and you're delivering, obviously, journalism that resonates with people who feel that sometimes they're caught in an echo chamber. I'm wondering if you're as concerned as I am and many others about um, social media and where it's going. I was just reading this week a story about uh, an Italian news outlet. So they published a story that Boris Johnson had snuck away to Italy in the middle of, you know, COVID crisis. And this was printed. It wasn't printed in their own publications. These are journalists who feel free to say anything on Twitter that wouldn't make the cut in their own uh, news organizations, for sure. The story was totally false. I mean, there were there was evidence of Boris Johnson being at press conferences and um, doing his job, but it doesn't matter. It had gone round the world, and everybody assumed Boris Johnson was just, you know, buggering off and not doing his job. It, and it, and this it was, is and it was very picked, troubling to and me. And it was also picked up by responsible media, who you would think have... Right. Some some layers uh, which uh, constitute checks and balances, editorial Correct. layers. And, right. and and yet it that went all over the place. Uh, it was it was in media everywhere. And and the, right. so so and and why are and why are we there? Well, of course, there's nothing new in the world of of journalism wanting to be out there to get to, you know to get that story first. But I think what we have lost in the need for speed. Are those layers? Who who is running? And oftentimes I sit there, go, who is running the news desk right now? If I if I, if I look at lots of different organizations, I can I can, exactly. look, I can look at the BBC, I can look at the CBC, I can I can look at all kinds of of, of course sources um, that are part of my daily uh, media diet. And and I think is someone not on the news desk right now? How did that get up there? Because now the story might be accurate, but if I look, sometimes I look at, at at what it's supposed to be world news, and there are the one or two predictable stories that should be there. And then suddenly you are in the world of celebrity fodder. And, and, and then I think a lot, a lot of stories, which, which are just becoming these box ticking hygiene stories that, you know, we have to be seen to be doing these stories. And I think these have no 
place on the foreign news desk, and yet they're there time and again. And I know you're baiting me right now, Pamela, because I'm not on social media. I, I've I've been rather <laughs> outspoken about it, and and all people always say to me, "It's like why you know why aren't you on Instagram or why aren't you on Twitter?" And and I think. I've got a magazine. I've got, we run a 24 hour radio station. I don't need, and I don't need to be on all the time. If I've got something to say, if I want to write an op-ed, if I, if there's something I want to vent about, then I also, I still want to be able to do that. I want Andrew Tuck, our editor to look at it and say, maybe you need to tone that down a bit. And then I wanted to go through my own fact checkers. And then if that takes eight hours or it takes eight minutes, it doesn't really matter. But I think that is some of the rigor that we are missing. Right. It's not just that we're missing it in media, we're missing this in society today because we talk so much about polarization. And, and this is, I think, one of the interesting lessons from this corner of the world. And, and if I look at German language newspapers and broadcasters, we still have debate. Because remember once upon a time, we used to have good old programs. And we, we could look back to the journal. We could look back at all kinds of different shows on Canadian television, American television, where people would have a good old ding dong on television. Exactly. And and now what do we have? We just have, I can watch a right wing news channel and I have a panel of people who are all agreeing on the same topic and saying that the liberals are wrong. I can flip channels and I get all the liberals, you know, nine, 10 of them, as many people as we <laughs> can possibly fit around a table on television. And then they're talking about it. But yes, it, it rarely happens today that in fact, you get Two people from polar opposite sides debating, debating as you should in a liberal democracy. All we get now is so-and-so said X on Twitter, and then we get another screen flashing up. And so the passion of debate, the passion of looking in someone's eye, that's completely, completely gone. It's the same way we see in our office place. Much easier to just fire off an angry email, and then you mm-hmm. get this extraordinary escalation, which we know could very easily have been diffused if you would have walked stood across up, the room, your bum, yeah. and had a conversation and had a conversation with your colleague, but yeah. that's, that's too scary. No, the, the, the sound bites and he said this and everybody looking for the most polarized two clips to juxtapose. And then that becomes somehow a balanced story. What troubles me is I think what you're, what you're saying is there's, there's declining intellectual rigor in the world of journalism uh, because it's been so consumed by social media and, and what's really lacking is context. We have to put issues of the day and people of the day in some kind of context to understand why they are who they are, why they say what they say, and what happened 40 years ago that we may be reliving. There's just no context. I think there's a lack of context, 100%. There's, and then I think on the other side, though, there's also a level of, of self-censorship, self-censorship as well. Mm-hmm where I think journalists are terrified to say something because they'll get shouted down. They will get tried in a court of social media. The executive at the TV network, at the newspaper, uh, suddenly gets terrified because they think, oh, our advertisers are going to flee and are going to go and run the other direction because we didn't fire that person. And, and, and that just creates an incredible spiral. And I think that's the other place. And this is what's, and this is what's interesting. This is where social media has you know, rather quickly managed to erode the fundamentals of what makes a functioning newsroom, of what makes a functioning responsible media brand. Because I think you should be able to say something, you know, in an, in an op-ed, of course, within the realms of, of course, what are the journalistic standards of that, of that media right. brand or within, or within that country. But that's, that's also not happening. And that's, that's incredibly dangerous as well, because, you know, you might have an opinion which is a little bit left or right of what is the prevailing narrative, uh, and and you're challenging people, but you get shouted down because uh, you know, you are you're, you're anti democracy or you're racist or, or you're, yeah. you're you're all kinds of things, yeah. and and we're very much in the middle of this right now, and and I think that this is this is to me it's hugely um, it's hugely dangerous, and and I and I and I put this squarely at at the feet of. Those companies, uh, which A, manage to profit, uh, of course, in advertising terms uh, from the traffic that they generate. Uh, but at the same time, there's just so much guff and, and, and things are incredibly, you know, things as we know are very nuanced. And I, and I go back to also being commercial. You know, sometimes actually, the, you know, the advertisers too, you have to understand the advertisers also are many that are run by smart people. <laughs> and I've, I've actually seen an instance right now mm-hmm. with a big financial services company who have pulled their advertising from a big U.S. media organization because they said, you know what, you're actually not doing a very good job. You've, you've, you've gone so, so PC, you've gone so far 
uh, down the liberal track, uh, that in fact, even though we don't want to see another Trump government, they said, you're doing exactly and repeating many of the same mistakes uh, that, of course, happened four years ago. And, and you're alienating people who you could be bringing on board as a media brand. And I think, I think that's admirable. I think that's very heroic for that company to say, we don't want to be advertising with you uh, because you're not, you're actually, you've, you've swayed yeah. too far in the other direction. Uh, so it's, and again, this, you know, as much as we can talk about leadership, there is a whole other yeah, I, I, uh, series to be done about the current state of, of media as we see it. And it's it's on the corporate side, on the business side as well. I, I and I know you've talked about this, and certainly we have that that business executives go on home and they somebody tells them they need a social media strategy, and they ask their six-year-old granddaughter, you know, whether she likes Facebook or TikTok or whatever, and then go plan a corporate strategy around this when it, it, it's just kind of riding the wave. It's not thinking through whether this is the right mechanism for you or whether this is going to reach your audience or whether that's how you want to be seen to reach your audience. Completely. And I'm, I'm always stunned thinking, yes, that's, let's go on TikTok with our brand just because you can, because it's cheap uh as as well <laughs> so of course someone can yeah. say look at how many eyeballs we're going to get but are they the right eyeballs were those were, are they even real eyeballs that are seeing it or was, was this just media that was consumed by a bot uh, somewhere sitting uh, in in a bunker deep deep beneath a mountain in wyoming or something you know we don't know and but of course the most important question <laughs> is is it right for your target and what what are you trying to say and and i think this is you know and, and you know, we can spool back over the last you know decade and look at the amount of of brands which you know i think now are sort of scratching their heads saying you know why why were we there in in the first place and and i think that you know it's it's one thing that you know it doesn't matter whether you are a politician or you're reading the nightly news or you're running a corner shop it's sometimes i think of course, the less said, the better. And, and it was interesting. We, we were interviewing, going back to Sam Ritz, we had uh, Kostas um, Bakoyanis, the, the mayor of Athens, um, was, was speaking at the conference. And, and he said, you know, I'm on Twitter, I'm on all kinds of things. But he said, when it comes to opinion, he said, I only stick to the city. He goes, I talk about Athens. He said, I don't wade in. He goes, I, goes I've got views about the current situation in the Aegean between Greece and Turkey. It's not my job as a mayor to weigh in on that. He goes, I have opinions right. about public behavior in North America. He said, I, I'm, not, I'm not the mayor of Minneapolis or of, of Louisville. He said, I, I have no place there. He goes, I have been elected by the citizens of Athens, and, that's, and, that, and, th and this is the realm that I'm, I'm there to govern. And, and why should I sort of step out of the city limits? And, I thought, and that's that, my job. I thought, and I thought, could more people you know, please adhere to that that type of sentiment it's exactly what we expect from our leaders no no one really everybody's stepping out in their out of their lane <laughs> with social media because you can have an opinion on anything cost free and and i think that that's this is this is a route that we need to go down and i proposed this once upon a time um, when i was writing for the financial times when people started, of course, oh, you know, and of course, the, when newspapers became much more digital and they could open everything up to comment, and uh, and then people would write to me saying, "Oh my goodness, hey, people say such horrible things about you in the newspaper, and they didn't like this, they didn't like that." And I said, first, I don't read the comments, and I said, the only people who get a comment and the only things I read are those that choose to write to my email address, and and I said because normally if people have to take the time to actually type in the email mm -hmm. address, etc somehow already a layer is taken off of that. But I said to the paper, I said, you could probably completely reverse the fortunes of the newspaper if you charge the cost of a stamp to make a comment. Because once upon a time, if you wanted to write a letter to the editor, <laughs> you had to go and buy the stamp, lick the stamp, write it's the letter. what you had to do. Exactly. Yep. Truck, truck down to, to, the, to the post box and send it. And by that time, actually, you get to the letterbox and you might just be so exhausted by your own opinion. You think, I, I sh I'm not going to send that. I don't want to look like an idiot in the Winnipeg, Winnipeg Free Press uh, with my letter. <laughs> I'm actually, I'm, going, I'm, not, I'm not going to bother. And, and I think that's in this moment of going, going back to this need for speed. People need to calm down or there needs to be a small speed bump. Before you post a comment, it's going to cost you 250 Correct. Anything to make you, I mean, it, it's just the, the number of tweets that are sent out that, that there's regret, you know, there's even, uh, you know, I've done it on occasion. I've just liked something and I've done it too quickly because I just didn't go and read the following things that were attached that was filled with garbage. Right. I just like that last moment. Like I, I think one other point, Pamela, as well is 
we've been talking a little bit about also what happened to forgiveness? What happened to just accepting the apology and moving on? Yeah. And I'm not a holy roller about this. I know that this is, I don't think this is a Sunday program, <laughs> but the fundamentals of much of our legal system, uh, certainly when I'm in, when we're in a court of law, uh, are, are built on some basics around Judeo-Christian society. And a big part of that is is forgiveness. And, and I think this is the other thing yeah. that we're completely missing. People make mistakes. And yet, in many instances... Uh, Again, people are tried in the court of social media. There is no trial. There is no real compelling evidence. He said this. She might have done that. And the next thing you know, great journalists, admirable politicians, captains of industry, artists, photographers are you know, literally taken to the city limits and never seen again. And, and, and when we could have yeah. a situation when... Actually, we don't know all the facts, and maybe that person needs to take a pause from society, but also we as the other side of society also need to take a pause, take a breath, and just move on. And and this is what I really, and I, you know, it's not just a case of looking stuff at the border from Canada or across the Atlantic uh, from here at, at the situation in the United States, et cetera. Of course, there's, there, there are a lot of historical issues about many things we could talk about, but there right. is also a component of, of we do need to look forward. Well, I, I, I really, that resonates with me. I, we've all been, anybody who's in the public eye has, uh, has been disparaged and, and some of us more so than others, but we're also living in this time of, of this cancel culture or judging, uh, somebody's behavior a century ago or 40 years ago by today's standard, ripping down a statue of Churchill or John A. Macdonald or, you know, I mean, it, that's the larger definition of understanding, putting things in in context and, and also offering, as you say, that societal forgiveness. That was then. This is now. I, I wonder, and this is something we've been talking about uh, around the dinner table with colleagues, is Rome going to get bulldozed at some point? Because the Romans did many extraordinary things in their time, <laughs> but I don't think they had a great reputation when it came to the rights of all kinds of people. No, that's true. So should the Colosseum should the, should the Colosseum come down? Should we just eradicate everything that was there? Because that is that's the next place we end up when you yeah. look at cancel culture. Because someone is going to get wound up about all of these different things and say, "Oh, you know, look at the role that you know that that the Romans played." in so many aspects of society. And yet, you know, or should we have a, a scale? And then do we say, well, but do we weigh that up against what was the total contribution of, of the Roman Empire? And, and I said, maybe you go the other way and you say, and I've often maintained this, that maybe the Italians to this day should send an invoice to many countries that where they, they built aqueducts and they built roads and uh, they <laughs> exactly. erected fortifications. And 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 no one, no one in a modern sense is also. This is the other thing. No one, no one says thank you that often today. Uh, and and I think, yeah. hmm, uh, Italy could sort of could wipe out all kinds of debt. I mean, Italy could be deliriously wealthy again uh, if they would just send an invoice to all the countries uh, that that they a horrible word to use even today, but I'm going to say it anyway. That they help civilize. Exactly, and the, and and what was what was innovation of the day for sure. You. You are described and I think self-declared global citizen. People have pushed back at you. I think Theresa May being a famous one saying, if you're a global citizen, you're a citizen of nowhere. I want to hear you a little bit on that notion because you've lived everywhere. Um, but also what you think about the concept of global globalization in the face of rising populism and powerful leaders and even what COVID unleashes in terms of uh, political constraint and debate restrictions on even debate. Where are you now? Well, right now I've been pretty much landlocked. I haven't crossed any major body of water for about six months. So, uh, <laughs> and and people say, God, how how are you managing to to stay at one place? But I said I haven't crossed any major bodies of water. But uh, I haven't just been sitting in in Zurich. I've been using uh, the train, the car. Uh, 
you know, planes now that air routes are opening up again, but, but have mostly, mostly been uh, in, in Europe uh, and mostly you know, a little bit of Austria, a bit of Germany, a bit of France, et cetera, uh, you know, getting out to uh, yeah, see, see clients, uh, have business meetings, uh, maybe having a bit of a holiday this, this summer as well. But if I think about probably the last three decades uh, of, of working as, as a journalist and also building, building a business, mm -hmm. uh, of course, for sure, Super fortunate to do that. Um, do do I do I feel guilty uh, about having to been to Japan scores of times? No, uh, because I feel that a large part of what I do, and this is the bit that we forget in this digital world, and we can maybe come back, as you said, to talk about COVID in a moment and and all the great things that that all things digital have brought us. But you have to be a witness, Pamela. You have to smell it. You have to touch it. You have to see it. And and for those who say, mm -hmm. well, can't journalists uh, just yeah have someone else on the ground uh, take the photo take the photos for you? Why can't you use a local freelancer to go and do that story? You can, and we do. And 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 it's and it, listen, not that, the that same is part of it. It's not sometimes the same. having uh, the local yep. correspondent who might also have grown up there. But I would say it's more important to have someone who has a completely different perspective. Can I take my Canadian lens, which has been living in London, uh, which uh, has been informed <laughs> by working in a German newsroom, and take that to Kabul? That, I'm not saying is always more interesting, but it delivers a different level of perspective. Uh, and, and that, right. in, in a way, is when we look at globalism uh, and, and glo globalization in general, this is what makes maybe the Australian CEO uh, more interesting to be sitting on, uh, you know, sitting at the top of a Canadian bank because he spent time in Amsterdam and, and maybe saw some similar forces there. And with his Australian shared Commonwealth perspective is maybe the more interesting person to be running that particular bank at that time. So I, I think we're, we're in an era and a time when, of course, we can't we can't uh, turn the dial back. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, we have to we see that the world is a volatile place. But in the midst of all of it, uh, there are seas of calm. There are seas of opportunity, and and certainly there are seas of education where we can learn things. And and so I I firmly believe we're in a place right now though where I go back to that that need for speed. Uh, that okay? Do do we need to be uh, you know, flying to Toronto from Zurich for every every meeting every time a client wants to see you? Perhaps not. Uh, but at the same time, I do believe we need to push forward. Uh, something happens when people come together in a room. And I saw that last week in, in, you know, in, in Emirates when we did our conference at the end of September. It was remarkable to see people light up and the dynamism that happens. And so we should not, it, we should not be seduced by the notion that looking into a backlit screen uh, is, is, is going to replace sitting across from one another at a table. And it was interesting. We had Peter Maurer, who's the head of the ICRC, head of the Red Cross. And, and he was just very clear about the fact, you are not going to advance yourself in a conversation with faction leaders in the Sahel, in Niger, uh, in Mali. On Zoom, exactly. Doing that yeah. over Zoom. You need to go and drink tea. You need to drink tea for seven hours. And then you have to literally break bread. And then maybe, maybe you'll start to get to the point where there is a level of trust and understanding and both sides know what they want out of that discussion. But if we believe that it can happen across a screen, I, I, I think we're, we're being delusional. I think this is what it's going to require um, is this sense of becoming more discerning. There are an awful lot of meetings we can do on Zoom. And no, we don't have to fly to Tokyo for a two-hour meeting. Uh, I think businesses are going to fundamentally change that way. But I don't think we can replace that um, that face to face. I would so much rather be in a room with you having this conversation. It's fine. I like this. I started in radio. I feel comfortable. That's what this is. You too. But, but I, I, I'd like to look at your face when we're having this conversation. I think it's important. It, it is. And, and again, I go, you know, we go back to where, where does media sit today? Let's not forget all of those companies, uh, that are talking to journalists, and of course, there is a lot. There's a lot of corporate influence um, in newsrooms, mm -hmm. not just from the corporations that, that might own media brands, but just the power of all of the big PR players. 
And for some people on a Tuesday morning, it, it, it's quite easy to, to of course, you know, speak to the PR for a company. They sort of put it in two or three journalists' ear that, you know, look, look at how great, look what technology is doing to positively change society. Look how good work from home is. And, and, and of course, one or two well-placed articles, uh, of course, you know, end up, uh, of course, all over social media. And then that becomes the narrative of the day. And, right. and again, it's, it's also, a, a, we're in a situation right now where downtown Toronto has been completely hollowed out. Mm-hmm. Uh, most North American cities, urban cores have been hollowed out because, goodness, are you going to go and challenge the prevailing view that, you know, uh, that, that maybe it's not great to work from home? And, and that's the situation that we're in right now because everyone says, oh, you know, we have to, we're fighting the pandemic. Everybody needs to stay at home. And, and yet we know that lots of people are not very happy being um, at home. They're not effective. Uh, relationships and families are unraveling. Someone told me a story the other day, one of the big Swiss banks, uh, three of the wives of, of very, very senior executives spoke to the CEO and said, you have to get <laughs> back to our work. husbands back <laughs> to work. And they have to lead by example. They have to go back to work because because otherwise... The marriage is over and this family <laughs> no, is going to unravel. No, it's not funny because I and, know... And I think that conversation is happening in a lot of places. Yeah, I think that's really true. And I, and I think... But it, the the other side of it is it's making us think about our workplaces and what can be different uh, and how we can protect a little bit more time for family. There are some things that could be done, you know, on Zoom if you just... If you've got a sick child that morning... Um, it doesn't have to become a fireable offense. Absolutely. And I think that that is one of the, the positive lessons out of all of it. But again, there needs to be, there needs to be a debate. Uh, is yeah. it great for the dry cleaner, uh, for, for the, the person who owns the muffin shop or, or even the big chain who's at the bottom of first Canadian place in Toronto or someone, um, who's in the basement of Plasville Marie, which is, you know, completely empty. So I think that is that's the other side of it, uh, you know, as, as well. And I think it's also we've seen, mm-hmm. yeah, it's great to you know if you've got a lovely house in the Cotswolds or you've got a place <laughs> up in Muskoka with uh, with high speed uh, fiber into it, great, uh, you know, that's fantastic, and you feel like you can be a captain of industry. But again, that doesn't represent everybody. I I I we've taken so much of your time, but I I do I can't leave without asking one question about. What's consuming everyone is uh, the state of America. There's so much focus on Trump and America. I read something the other day that Tom Wolf had once said that America runs on a very special fuel, the huge disparities in social status. We see the divisions in politics. We see BLM. We see riots. We see police shootings. We see all of these things. Do you think that... The Grand American Empire is in decline or has already done so? I think Brand America is under enormous challenge. When I say Brand America, I don't just mean the economic might of of the U.S. But I think if I think about what, what is what is if we look at the 20th century, the 21st century, what has been America's uh, greatest export? If you look at a single sector, I think it would be popular culture. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that U.S. pop culture is quite the magnet, does not have those, the level of aspiration. Uh, yes, HBO turns out lots of great series. But if, I, if you go down a level below all of that and, and then you think that I, I, want, to, I want to live like this, uh, that I'm actually getting cultural cues and codes, which I want to be part of my daily life. That's what I think about cultural export. And, and with a cultural export, you need people to, to of course, consume, consume these things. And I don't see the, the level of attraction anymore. Once upon a time, you could speak to a young Austrian, uh, you'd speak to a young Belgian, a young Australian, and I'm sure we could speak to lots of young Canadians. Yeah. Is there that draw? Is there that desire to go and live in New York? Uh, is it that draw and desire to go and start your tech firm in Seattle uh, or, or Los Angeles? Up to a point. But I think people are more inclined to to look elsewhere, and, and I, I, I certainly see that. Of course, uh, Europe and and the United States are, are pulling further apart, um, and some of this, of course, even pre, I would say some of this even predates uh, the current administration um, that we're talking about. Mm-hmm. And then there is just this of enormous 
polarization and a polarization and a righteousness as well, where if it's not the American way, and I think we could even be talking about, I think, some of these contemporary topics where people think, well, this is an American view of culture and and therefore the same thing has to play out on the streets of Helsinki as much as it does Melbourne. Well, these places don't share the same history and they have their own set of problems. Uh, they have also their own set of, uh, of course, opportunities as well. And the world spins in a very different way for them. And so this is what I find very curious about this, this whole, you know, this, this liberal sort of American view about the way things should be, uh, the way we should conduct ourselves in daily life, the way we should interact with one another, etc. I don't, you know, it, that in and of itself, I think is, is a little bit rich because suddenly <laughs> you, you're imposing your own values exactly. on people who live in the Czech Republic. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's like, well, actually Czech society doesn't function like that. So maybe we, we don't need the same social codes, which work in the United States. So, so that, you know, I'd say, well, is not slightly racist and odd behavior, uh, but yep. yet for some reason, and this of course goes back to, of course, the power of, of, of American media, um, that, uh, that, that of course, you know, they've got, of course, the largest share of voice. Um, and, and then suddenly you, you start to get this embrace as, as a result. But I feel that people are, it, it's, we're at a point right now where it was attractive, uh, once upon a time. And I think now oftentimes people think have they, I mean, not not just a few people. I mean, many people think, have they gone properly nuts? But I think also the narrative <laughs> of also a lot of U.S. media uh, as well doesn't play very well in many corners of the world. Do you still think of yourself as a Canadian? I think of myself as as a Canadian who was born in 1968 in in Winnipeg uh, at, at a time when. I, I'm second generation in, because my my mom was my mom was born in in Germany. One side of our family is Estonian. My dad's side, of course, Brule, very French Canadian yep. name. Uh, but yes, I um, and and but I say that as a ch as a child of, of the late '60s because we forget uh, about Canada in you know the we're only talking about you know it was 20 plus years after the war mm -hmm. and and the wave of you know, of immigrants uh, who showed up and and built a new life in Canada, where there was this this proximity that we had though to to Europe. So yes, I feel Canadian, but I also I grew up in a household where I felt in, incredibly Estonian, and right. uh, you know most of our family settled in and around Ottawa. You know, after the war, where the Estonians went and built something which up the Ottawa River, which looked very much like lots, many parts of the Baltic with their summer houses and their saunas and, and their Estonian flags and, and all of these things. That was very much part of, of my upbringing. Uh, and, and also where that was celebrated, uh, you know, sometimes I think everyone, you know, we're in a multi culty world right now. And, and, and sometimes I feel that some of the force of society think that that that's, that's an invention of today. But if I look back at right. my, my classroom in Kitchener, um, or or going to uh, junior high in in Winnipeg, that was so much of of daily life uh, in school, and and it's it's sometimes sometimes it gets up your nose today to think, wait a second, this is you know this this has been with us for a long time. In fact, exactly what's different what yeah. was different then was it was actually is that it hadn't it's not been politicized. It was just it was part of what we did, and of course we had we had kid, we had we had kids from Sri Lanka, we had kids uh, you know from Portugal, we had you know kids from all over the world at school, and and of course that's. That's Canada. Um, Indigenous kids, like we absolutely. So, and know. yet somehow it's uh, you know we think that this is a, a contemporary creation, uh, but this is of course very much the makings of what Canada is. It's just been so great talking with you. Uh, I, I I really enjoyed it, and and I'm it's kind of a tour of different kind of thinking about where we are. And I really appreciate it. I think we all, as I said earlier, need a little more context and perspective for what we're thinking. It's just great, Tyler. Thank you. And congratulations on your success. Thank you very much for taking the time as well. It's wonderful to talk to you. Thanks, Tyler. Bye-bye. Tyler is an interesting media mogul, that's for sure. It's something we really haven't done, that length of a conversation. But if you like the long form, please engage with us on social media. And if you're willing, 
please rate this podcast. I'm told it really matters.